This is Dr. Quest. Well, of course I do. Well, I'm glad to hear that. It has been a long time. kid back in 1964 and you had a television set, chances are you wanted to be Johnny Quest. Neither Joe Barbera nor William Hanna started out to be animators. Hannah studied engineering and journalism and out of college worked as a structural engineer until the depression left him unemployed. He turned to cartooning and went to work for Leon Schlesinger as a coffee boy who pushed a broom and wiped animation cells. He also got to offer story ideas and in 1937 was hired by MGM as a director and story man in their cartoon department. Barbera, a New Yorker who aspired to be a boxer, was a Wall Street bank teller who sketched and doodled in his spare time until he sold one of his cartoons to Collier's Magazine and in 1937 moved out to Hollywood to join the MGM Animation Department within weeks of William Hanna being hired there as well. Joe Barbera and William Hanna began collaborating as an animation team in 1938. Over the next decade, the team created over a hundred Tom and Jerry cartoons for theaters and received no less than seven Academy Awards for their work. By 1955, they were co-heads of MGM's animation unit. They remained there until the advent of television brought the animation division to a close in 1957. The movie cartoon business was dead, Bill Hanna said. The only alternative for animation was television. But everyone they talked to said the same thing. Animation was too expensive for TV. In desperation, the team created what they called planned animation. When a character talked, only his mouth would move, meaning only the mouth and lower jaw would need to be redrawn for each frame. Bodies, arms, legs, anything that didn't need to move could be one still image for the entire shot, and only the things that needed to move in that frame would have to be added. Talking heads, blinking eyes, or if someone needed to shake hands, only the parts that did the shaking would need to be redrawn. The result was a seven minute cartoon that only needed 2,000 drawings, where the average Tom and Jerry cartoon, done in full animation, would require 14,000 drawings for the same seven minutes. While it took months to convince anyone that their planned animation would work, a Screen Jams presentation. Eventually, Screen Jam spent $10,000 to see a sample cartoon about a dim-witted dog named Ruff and his cat companion, Reddy. Get set, get ready, here comes Ruff and Reddy. They're tough, but steady, always Ruff and Reddy. Screen Jam sold the samples to NBC as a series, and the Hanna-Barbera empire was born. The biggest show in town is Huckleberry Hound. The boys quickly developed the Huckleberry Hound show. Huckleberry. Huckleberry Hound's success was so amazing that minor characters who appeared on the show were quickly spun off. Kellogg's, your best choice in cereals, the best to you each morning, has brought you... Who else? Yogi Bear. By 1961, the team was turning out over 4,500 minutes of animation a year, including one series they tried in prime time. Until then, something unheard of for television animation. Basically a prehistoric version of the Honeymooners, and costing $65,000 an episode, the Flintstones became the most expensive half hour on television. It was also a groundbreaking success. The demand from sponsors that Hanna-Barbera give them more primetime series that pulled in adult audiences along with children 
resulted in two more primetime series. But when these costly primetime shows only lasted a season because they did not share the same success as the prehistoric Bedrock family, TV's cartoon wonderkind, Hannah and Barbara, seemed to be faltering. Hannah and Barbara were visionary men, though. These were the fellows that, though color TV sets were rare and expensive, had the foresight to create all of their cartoons in color, foreseeing a time when black and white shows would be obsolete and color televisions would be the norm. These were the men that came up with planned animation so cartoon programming would be possible for television. So no one needed to tell Hannah Barbera that now was the time to look to the future or that now was the time for another radical departure from what had been. The press release announcing Johnny Quest emphasized exactly that, a radical departure from the funny animals and kitty fair that this bold new experiment was about to offer Hanna Barbera. In 1964, the creation of a cartoon series that featured realistic characters and artwork was an unbelievable undertaking. The closest thing up to then had been Clutch Cargo, which superimposed human lips on cartoon faces for each character's dialogue. Hannah and Barbara knew they would need a very different kind of artist to create the show they wanted. The man they chose was comic book legend Doug Wildey. Self-taught, the New York native learned his art, as many did, by studying the masters of the adventure comic strips. Described as independent, outspoken, irascible, and sometimes blunt to the point of rudeness, the bulk of Wildey's early work prior to 1960 was for Atlas, the predecessor to Marvel Comics. He began work there in 1954 and illustrated virtually every genre they then published. Fantasy, horror, crime, romance, and especially westerns. Which is probably why in 1952, Wildey moved his family west to Tucson, Arizona. Over the years, Doug's work became increasingly influenced by cinema. which helped give his drawing a unique quality not often seen in comic books. Another comic book legend, Alex Toth, was in Los Angeles working on an animated series called Space Angel when he asked Doug to come to L.A. and join him. Doug was hired on a trial basis for one week, but worked 14 weeks on the series until it ended and he found himself in Los Angeles and out of work. He applied to Universal as a storyboard artist and while he was waiting to hear back, Someone told him to take samples of his work over to Hanna-Barbera, where they were in the planning stages of doing a very unique project. Doug met Bill Hanna, who asked if he could, in his comic book style, design an animated adventure series. Doug storyboarded scenes, designed some characters, and even wrote some dialogue. All things he had been doing, creating his own strips and comic books for years. When Joe Barbera saw this work, he hired him instantly as the show's director. Hanna Barbera had their man to design their action-adventure show. And the show was Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Wheaties, Breakfast of Champions, bring you the thrilling adventures of Jack Armstrong, the All-American Boy. Though most of us are too young for that title to mean anything, Jack Armstrong was a long-running CBS radio show. 
where Hudson High School student Jack Armstrong joined his Uncle Jim for a series of globetrotting adventures. Sponsored by Wheaties, Jack Armstrong transformed the term Breakfast of Champions into a major marketing phenomenon. Doug designed a two and a half minute test film for Jack Armstrong, the All-American boy. Whether it was ever shown to the networks is unclear, but you've seen it many times. Some of it at the end of every episode of Johnny Quest. But Jack Armstrong never really got off the ground. Why? Had the rights to the characters suddenly become too pricey? Or did Hannah and Barbera suddenly realize the incredible talent of the man they had just hired? Either way, the Armstrong project was suddenly shelved and the boys asked Doug Wildey if he could design an original action-adventure show. Doug Wildey then began thinking about his own All-American Boy and the world he would create for him. That's right. Doug's original title for the adventures of Johnny Quest was actually the saga of Chip Ballou. The next title for the show was Quest File 037. Then it became the adventures of Johnny Quest and later in syndication shortened to just Johnny Quest. Quest was a name he eventually picked out of the L.A. phone book for its adventurous implications. In this note to a lucky fan, Doug claims this was the first draft concept for Johnny himself. Doug said a variety of influences helped him shape the title character of Johnny Quest. One was young Jackie Cooper. This rough, tough, precocious boy Jackie often played was much like Johnny. And young Jackie Cooper's relationship to, say, Wallace Beery or George Raft, depending on the film, was another relationship model for him to use, creating the dynamic between Johnny and Race. I forgot to remind you, you've got some homework to do, haven't you? Yes, sir. Make sure you do it. Yes, sir. Good boy. This is Hydrofoil, over and out. You know what the trouble with the world is, Race? No, nope. suppose you tell me. It's gotten too scientific. <laughs> I know just how you feel. Tell you what. First, you can help me with the emergency ejector system and then do your homework. How'd that be? Oh, just darn near perfect. <laughs> Bandit thinks so, too. Hey, Reese! Looks like Dad's got visitors. Come on, Bandit! Oh, no, you don't. The relationship between the athletic and self-assured race and the eager Johnny resembled a similar one between Terry and Pat Ryan in Terry and the Pirates. One of the most successful comic strips of all time it ran from 1934 to 1946 and then into the 1950s as a radio show. Terry and the Pirates resembles Quest not only for some of the characters, but also in the sharp, angular look of the artwork, the emphasis on scientific gadgets and high-tech hardware, and the far-flung exotic locales for the action. Doug had worked with Milt Caniff and stated categorically that he was the greatest storyteller in the business. Doug had little doubt that this was the major influence on his quest creations and laughed when he said that imitation was, after all, the sincerest form of flattery. I can stall them just long enough to give you and the kids a fighting chance to reach the cliffs. 
and leave you to face those beasts by yourself? I'll be right behind Savvy you. storyteller that he was, Wildy knew the relationships in Johnny Quest. Okay now, Doctor. Good luck. And do you race? For the most important element of the show. Let's go, boys. You, come with us. Dad, don't go! It's all right, son. Don't worry. But Dad, you'll... What if he goes back there, he'll be... Oh, why didn't he tell him it's set to explode, Race? You know the answer to that, Johnny. He won't tell him. Not even to save his own life. And Race, where is he, by the way? He's outside, trying to wash off those berry stains. And he believed that when the show did work, it worked because of these relationships. Oh? Why is that? Because the dye from those purple berries will not wash off. It must wear off. And how long does that take? At least three weeks. Three weeks? Oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> and that'll be enough of that. Yes, O oh God of the water. Oh, yes, Sakizio. We hear you and obey. <laughs> Johnny was voiced by 16-year-old Tim Matheson. Hi, Mom. What are you doing up so early on a Sunday? Doug couldn't believe what a fantastic actor this kid was. Anything you want. Mom, you and Dad aren't going to start competing for us, are you? Well, I mean, I've been telling you about that extra thick bacon for years. In fact, he couldn't believe he was 16, either. He looked too young to drive himself to work, but Doug said he did so every recording day. With close to 150 films and TV shows to his credit, Tim is best known today for his role in John Landis' hit film Animal House, and more recently on TV's The West Wing. Today he is also a busy television director for many series, including the CBS show Cold Case. Okay, Johnny, let's bring Banda to board. Coming up, one plump pup. Joe Barbera and Doug Wildey talked about a much more exotic pet for young Johnny Quest than a small bulldog named Bandit. Doug wanted a white cheetah and or a monkey to make up the animal contingent of Quest File 037. He liked the monkey idea especially because of the story possibilities, namely what a monkey could do that a dog could not. Doug also felt that with years and years of Lassie, a boy and his dog had been done enough, but this was not his real objection to Bandit. While he never liked that Quest or other dramatic animation shows were referred to as cartoons, and he never called Johnny Quest that. When he thought of cartoons, he said he thought of Bugs Bunny. You're despicable. And not in a negative way. He said these were cartoons loved the world over and that he truly respected and appreciated them. These were pure cartoons, he said in one interview, and he believed that the cartoon world had no place in the non-cartoon universe he was being asked to create for Johnny Quest. There's Bandit! Come on, Bandit, jump, jump! Which is why in the case of Bandit, Doug's biggest objection was that he was obviously a cartoon dog in an otherwise realistic and dramatic world. In fact, Doug says his reaction was rather volatile about having to make Johnny's pet not just a dog, but a dog who was more Huckleberry Hound than Johnny Quest. In one interview, Wildey said that Bandit might have actually been the suggestion of a toy company in order to get a saleable stuffed animal. A man named Dick Bickenbach designed Bandit, making him the only character in the Quest cast that Wildey did not create. Bickenbach was what Wildey called a Flintstone kind of designer, and while Doug thought he did a good job with the canine, the bedrock influence in Bandit's look and mannerisms is more than evident. For Hanna-Barbera, it was creating a balance between the promised documentary reality style of the show How you doing, Bandit? and what they were now calling <laughs> creative adventure. Oh, my God. 
tried to keep Bandit working as at least comedy relief, so he would feel like less of a prop. Comedy relief was probably a good thing in Johnny Quest, if nothing else to spare its core audience of eight-year-olds from having too many nightmares about abominable snowmen or robot spiders. When former employees from the studio talk about working on Johnny Quest back in the 60s, they have little good to say about the experience. It caused long hours, missed vacations, and little time for family. A studio already at maximum output was trying to do the impossible on a weekly TV schedule, and many suffered under the burden. Hanna-Barbera had two network shows on the air, Quest and the Flintstones, and this enormous burden, more than 50 half hours needed to be produced for the year, in addition to their syndicated series, created all kinds of trouble at Johnny Quest, because quality control became impossible. <laughs> As these frames from actual episodes show, many of these animators were incapable of drawing in the style Johnny Quest relied on. In one interview, Doug admitted that Hanna-Barbera did not have the kind of artists or animators to actually do what they set out to do with Johnny Quest. To meet deadlines, many different animators worked on the Quest show, some pulling double duty on the Flintstones and other series also in production. Some nights he would get calls from artists in a panic because they simply could not draw nor authentically animate in the style Doug's design set for the show. What I wanted was a moving comic strip, Wildey said, with the blacks and shadow, and that it became a matter of educating network people that creating and animating this kind of artwork didn't come cheap because more drawings would be required and with much greater detail. This meant it would take more time, and time, of course, is money. It was turning out to be one bold experiment, all right. Hannah and Barbera watched costs climb as more and more effort was funneled into the series to maintain the documentary reality they had promised the series would showcase. Oftentimes, a shot drawn to be photographed at one distance, say this one, then gets used for a tighter shot as well. This avoids the time and expense of creating a wide shot and a close-up shot, but the problem is that when you punch in too close for a shot that wasn't intended for it, you get this, when it should look like this. idea why that native would be so afraid of you? None. Unless he has run amok. They do sometimes, you know. He uh, spoke of dragons. A classic quest shortcut I call the off-screen turnaround is when an object would fly or run out of frame and then it would simply re-enter the frame now heading in the opposite direction. 
avoiding the complex drawings it would take to show the object turn around. This actually helped the storytelling on occasion because you didn't always expect the object to suddenly reappear the way it does. Creating the element of surprise that you wouldn't get if you simply watched the object turn around. My favorite quest shortcut is what I call the Johnny Slide. Again, avoiding a complex animation of Johnny coming to a sudden halt from a full turn, they would just slide a single cell of skidding Johnny into frame. Again, this really helped the storytelling. Johnny's slides were dramatic and stylized, and that was perfect for the tone of the show, and a good example of how sometimes a lack of money and time results in the creation of something cool and distinctive you wouldn't normally have thought of. Johnny, swim from a hydrofoil! financial limitations of television animation and the somewhat limited resources of Hanna-Barbera's TV animation machine undercut Doug Wildey's idea of a moving comic strip. The magazine Television Chronicles may have said it best. The animation itself in Quest isn't anything to get excited about, but much of the artwork is of high quality. I think the magazine understates this, but they did get it right. Doug's enormous talent as an illustrator informs bits and pieces of every episode. You can easily pick out the shots. Because of their detail, there is little animation in them, but they are the core of the entire show, especially when Doug's sketches and designs were literally traced over and painted by the Hanna-Barbera team. Ironically, the first animation series he ever created would be what he is most remembered for in his 60-year career. Doug never understood the limitations of what we could do, Joe Barbera stated in an audio interview, alluding to the tension that continued to grow throughout the production. Doug concedes that he was new to the animation business and said time and time again that the hardest lesson he learned was that unlike writing and drawing his own comic strips, on television, people actually came and changed things you had created. It was just out of Doug's experience until it happened continuously on Johnny Quest. Doug says suddenly the thing got away from us all. He said once something starts going through the mill in a huge studio like Hanna-Barbera, you just can't hold it all together. The network just wasn't willing to put up the kind of money they really needed to create the artwork and animation necessary to make Quest the animated phenomenon they had advertised it would be. This is where the adventures of Johnny Quest, to Doug's idea, wasn't just a bold experiment. But a failed one. Because when artists who were hired for the Flintstones were suddenly assigned shots from Johnny Quest, the horrific yetis created by the Quest designers, sometimes look like they came from Bedrock or Jellystone Park. Part of the problem, says Doug, was that he got so involved in the publicity push for the show that he was often forced to neglect the actual production of the episodes. The publicity department at Hanna-Barbera had created such a feeding frenzy for this amazing new program coming to ABC that Doug Wildey, creator and now suddenly spokesperson for the show, was spending more and more time doing interviews with giants of the time like Life magazine. Ironically, says Doug, the quality of the show was falling very short of what Doug wanted and what the studio was promising. So Doug, with the encouragement of the publicity department, started telling lies to the press to maintain the building excitement about the show. Ironically, if the show had been properly budgeted and its high standards for quality supported, some claim it really might have revolutionized TV animation and truly taken it to the next level. To get the idea of how titanic an undertaking this weekly animated show was, 
I think we should review for a moment everything that went into creating 27 minutes of animation back in 1963. After a story is agreed upon, a script is written, or rather sometimes conceived, at the same time as a storyboard. A storyboard resembles a comic book because each shot is represented in a quick sketch that will eventually be turned into full-color animation with music and sound. Either it's a king-sized duck or we're not the only ones on this ship. Turu! Turu! This Turu have skin! No feather! He fly! That's impossible. What is it? It's a trained Pteranodon. Trained to kill. But who trained it? I don't know, but he's got to be stopped. Based on these boards, layout artists, voice actors, animators, and the episode's director start that long journey toward a finished show. First the script, and then the boards become the blueprint for each shot, including how that shot will move. One of the reasons why part of this process is often called layouts. For instance, a shot that pans from one place to another looks like this in the storyboards. After the script and boards are approved, the actors come in to record the dialogue. Well, Dad, honest, I know the difference between a whale and a sub. Here, the process again has stages that on a weekly basis are staggering for a live action show, let alone one that had to be drawn frame by frame. Recording the principal cast and all the supporting parts in the script was one stage. But wait, where are all these characters coming from? Creating a cast of thousands was another key and never-ending job. Which is why Doug hired the man who brought him to LA in the first place, Alex Toth, to help with the design of the 26 episodes. Characters went through some fairly major changes as some existing artwork shows. All of the finished designs approved by either Doug or Joe Barbera. Alex and another legend, Warren Tufts, designed characters, props, and sets that would create the graphic, comic book kind of animated storytelling Hannah and Barbara were promising to deliver with Doug at the helm. Each shot must be conceptualized, usually with pencil drawing, and then animated. The animation is tested, again in pencil sketches, before the movements are approved and those pencil sketches move on to the ink and paint department. This department takes each pencil sketch and traces it in ink onto a clear piece of acetate, basically plastic see-through paper, turning each sketch into what is then called a cell. Once a cell is inked, the paint department takes over. This is where each cell gets its color. Each drawing is hand-painted on the back with the various colors needed to achieve the final look. It takes about 12,000 inked and painted cells to create one 27-minute episode. The cell must be photographed against a background, and the background department worked overtime on the adventures of Johnny Quest. This show required much more than a Flintstone couch passing by in perpetuity in the background. The quest stories required detailed, photorealistic backdrops, often reflecting locales around the globe.
Stacks of these backgrounds were required for every episode and on a weekly basis. These were intricate, atmospheric murals that in many cases were themselves true works of art. To appreciate the caliber and quality of the work I'm talking about, here are just a handful of some of the layouts and backgrounds created for Johnny and his adventures. With the help of Photoshop, these original background paintings have been digitally restored and reassembled to their full length, and I believe are seen here not only in their full glory, but perhaps for the first and only time ever. Doug admits that his personal favorite, the episode he showed whenever he was asked to speak about the series, was Shadow of the Condor. I wouldn't expect to see two planes like that up here. You've kept them in fine shape, Baron. How else would a man treat his memories, Dr. Quest? <laughs> An aim like that must be a little rough on your feathered friend. Good shot, Mr. Bannon. You would make a worthy opponent. These gentlemen, I must must warn you. Julio. I thought... Oh, I can talk, gentlemen, when there is something that has to be said. What's wrong, Julio? This truly was one of the best-looking shows of the series. Speak to me, Julio. What did you tell them? What did you tell them? I know you can talk. I heard you. And what have you done with Willy? What have you done with Willy? The layouts and artwork were powerful and the story entirely plausible. A World War I flying ace out to score one more airborne kill decides to do so in the way of race banning. most dangerous game only in the air over the Andes with vintage World War I planes. 
and the giant birds that soared the same sky. Bandit, come back here! Heal, heal! All right, all right. That's enough for today, Bandit. Your mongoose has had it. Oh, no, you don't! That man, that man, he's getting away. Okay, buddy, who are you? Let him go, Johnny. He just saved my life. Yeah, Dad, but I don't trust him. It is well you do not. Hey! Now we are even. Say, you're pretty good at judo. Friends? Friend! Doug loved the disparity between Johnny and Haji, who were roughly the same age but came from two different worlds. Johnny came from a world of wealth and privilege, but Haji was a poor boy who came from poverty and mysticism. When the Quest learn that Haji is an orphan, they not only make him part of the family, but give Johnny a best friend who is now his adopted brother. But Haji wasn't the poor orphan boy to be pitied, or the dark-skinned slave of the upscale Quest, not by any stretch of the imagination. Haji, baby! Taught by an ex-Marine turned colorful character Pasha Peddler, Haji is as street smart, if not more so, than young Johnny, and as some episodes humorously point out, better educated than Johnny as well. And speaking of good boys, how about you two? Oh yes, sir. Our department has been most exemplary. Yeah, and besides that, we've been good too. Doug Wildey wanted a friend for Johnny who was not the cliched friend as minority character. As for Haji's magic, his powers included hypnosis, levitation, and telekinesis. You say, Haji, show me that levitation trick again, will ya? We're supposed to be doing homework, Johnny. Oh, come on, just once more. Okay, we'll try it on Bandit. Seem, seem, salabim. Doug thought these powers were overdone. Seem, seem, salabim. Ah! Hey, boo! Here is one of them. Where? Here! No, here! Yoo-hoo! Here I am! Again, crossing a line that didn't mix well with the Quest universe of believability he was trying to maintain. Haji's full name is Haji Singh, patterned after the first actor from India to make it big in Hollywood. His name was Sabu, and he starred in the 1942 version of Rudyard Kipling's The Jungle Book and the 1940s Thief of Baghdad. Haji is voiced by actor Danny Bravo. At the time of Johnny Quest, Danny's big screen career included For the Love of Mike with Richard Basehart and a featured role in The Magnificent Seven. Doug remembers that there were objections to having a street kid in India become Johnny's friend. Like Whose objections, whether they be the networks or Hanna-Barbera's, never fully materialized. And if Bandit was a battle lost, Wildey can count Haji as one battle won. 
Doug liked the idea of a Middle Eastern boy because that cultural background was so unique to audiences at the time. Sound boy. Haji go. Elephant, his brother. Haji, no! Haji, come back here! could also be worked into the various stories and exotic locations. 